Sahana Bunaktu Sahavir Yang Karavavai Tejas Vinavaditamastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. So good morning and welcome to the Saturday morning class on Swami Prabhavananda's translation of and commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, which he totaled, titled, which he titled, How to Know God. We're on Sutra 17 of chapter one in which the Swami has been <clears throat> explaining that the cosmic mind goes back and forth between phases of potentiality known in the Vedas as the night of Brahma. During this phase, the Gunas are in perfect equilibrium and there is no manifestation. And then the cycle of manifestation, known as the day of Brahma, in which there is the potentiality that existed within the uh, night of Brahma, becomes manifest as uh, the universe that we experience. So they, it, it cycles back and forth over inconceivably long periods of time. So the Swami goes on to say, a scientifically minded student should compare Vedanta cosmology with the latest theories of atomic physics. Uh, that's one of the things that will be discussed tomorrow morning when we discuss the wonder of your stardust spacesuit. Um, we will look at some of the aspects of Vedanta cosmology and compare them with the latest uh, theories uh, and findings of not only atomic physics, uh, but uh, astrophysics and a modern cosmology, scientific cosmology. The Swami goes on to say he will find many points of resemblance between the two systems. And the Swami would say, be careful about trying to force one uh, into the mold of the other. These were developed <clears throat> in very different ways, Vedanta cosmology primarily developed in a right brain dominant manner in the Upanishads, although we do find <clears throat> in Sankhya philosophy, the Sankhya formulation, a more left brain, a left brain dominant uh, uh, way of explaining what we uh, are and experience. And you can tell that right away by the translation of the word Sankhya means counting, 
or enumeration, which is a left mind function. So before we go on to uh, the Swami's explanation, are there any comments or questions? Anything from your own wisdom or experience you'd like to offer? Or any concern or question you'd like to raise? Nothing? Well, the right brain, left brain uh, discussion is between Sankhya and the other philosophy. I mean, is are we also saying that there is a similar thing, right brain, left brain, when we are talking philosophy versus science, like in atomic science? Uh, Einstein said that his, the ideas that he elaborated mathematically, which is a left brain function, the ideas that he, uh, formulated were given to him because he said he had the gift of fantasy, which of course is a right brain function. Uh, and uh, he was a great fan of fantasy and imagination. He said, if you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. He didn't say train them in calculus. He said, read them fairy tales. Aldous Huxley was very much of the same opinion. If you read his book, Island, he said that the first thing that children should be uh, allowed to uh, uh, fathom and bring to its fullest extent for in their being is their gift of imagination. Then they should learn the power of cooperation so that the things that they can imagine, uh, they can both cooperate with others and their imagined uh, projects, and they can gain <clears throat> the cooperation of others in making real what they imagine. So uh, quantum physics, Max Planck, who invented, I shouldn't say invented, but first used the word quanta or quantum, he imagined, he, he did not calculate, he simply let his mind rest on the problem of what radiation is because that's the assignment he'd been given and he was not able to find anything in newtonian physics left brain dominant physics that helped him explain it so he then just let the thing rest in his imagination and came up with the concept of quanta or quantum, the, the rudiments of quantum mechanics. Richard Feynman, the new Nobel Prize laureate, was once asked about God by a BBC interviewer. And Dr. Feynman said, well, you know, I don't know anything about God but I do love mother nature and I implore her to share her secrets with me. I implore her, in other words, pray to her to share her secrets with me. This is a right brain approach to discovery through prayer and contemplation. So there's a great deal of right brain dominant activity, particularly in the more modern physics. But we can go back to 1306 to 
Meister Eckhart, the German mystic and saint, and he experienced, that is to say, in his meditation, which is emphatically a right brain dominant activity, <clears throat> right brain and heart centered activity, he experienced what he called a boiling in the ground of being. He was contemplating on how what we experience came to be. He did not figure this out. He experienced what he called bolito, a boiling in the ground of being. And he said this boiling became so intense that it became ebolito. Now, ebolito in Latin means a sudden boiling over, like the top of a pressure cooker blowing off. Now, it sounds very like Meister Eckhart speaking about the Big Bang, or in the Vedanta formulation, again, a right brain formulation of, out of the Vedas of the cosmic mind or Brahman manifesting out of the power of its being, not out of will, simply out of the power of its being because it can, manifesting Maya. Maya be, being a disequilibrium of the gunas generated something called Hiranyagarbha. Hiranyagarbha translates as the cosmic egg. The cosmic egg, the activity within this egg, which was a subtle form, became so intense it could not be contained and so the cosmic egg burst open and the result is jagat so the formulation in vedanta is brahman maya hiranyagarbha jagat jagat went from subtle to gross <coughs> over a period of time. So that's a little bit of what the Swami is gesturing to when he says that we co compare uh, the resemblance between the two systems. Any follow-on? And thank you for that, Bhaskar. Any follow-on to what Bhaskar uh, raised. That was great. Thank you. You're more than welcome, dear. It's a joy to talk with you about it. To go on with what the Swami wrote, the gunas are sometimes described as energies, sometimes as qualities, but no single English word can define the whole nature and function. In other words, the gunas are an integral part of what we think of as shakti, the divine energy uh, in feminine form, uh, shakti or kali. And so they are an integral part of her being and are the way in which she manifests they are the they are the tools by which she manifests everything but as the swami said no single english word uh the, the three that have been used so far energies qualities tools these are all gestures towards something that is beyond thought and speech So, collectively, the gunas may be thought of 
as a triangle of forces composed yet uh, opposed, a triangle of forces opposed yet complementary. What does it mean, complementary? Tamas can be thought of as stupidity and ignorance. It can also be thought of as inertia. There is no such thing as a fulcrum without a, an inertial, a, a, a base on which the fulcrum rests and moves. So another way of talking about the gunas is tamas as the concealing power. That which is concealed is then projected by rajas, the projecting power, and then its true nature is revealed to us by the revealing power of sattva. The projecting power of rajas is inherently uh, leads to uh, because it, it is made of vanity, uh, according to Holy Mother, made of vanity and materialism, it, it leads to our uh, entanglement. So we are freed, the beginning of our freedom from this entanglement be, comes through sattva, which is developed through spiritual practice, emphasis on sattva. But this is what he means by opposed, concealing as opposed to revealing, concealing as opposed to revealing, projecting as opposed to revealing. They are all opposed, but complementary. They all exist. And if you wish to understand this in some depth, there are treatises on Sankhya philosophy that will give you a, a, a pretty good idea. I mean, Sankhya, if you look into the formulation of Sankhya and how it explains what we see, for anyone who's studied chemistry, the uh, enumeration of the Sankhya, so much of this, so much of this, that so much of the third guna, it will remind you immediately of the periodic table. So much plus of this, plus so much of that, plus so much of this, uh, results in this atom, <clears throat> and so on. So any, any question about the gunas before we go on? Because until we have some grasp of the gunas, the rest of this is going to be very difficult to uh, assimilate. So quantitatively, when we are saying the gunas are in balance, is it one third, one third, one third opposing, or what does equilibrium or balance mean? It means that they are they have their they their vibration ceases. So there no, there's no longer any manifestation of them at all. This is what is meant by being in equilibrium. <clears throat> one third, one third, one third would be a vibration of one third tamasic vibration, one third rajasic vibration, one third sattvic vibration. And just what that would result in, I do not remember, but it is, it is enumerated by Sankhya. The, the being in equilibrium means no more vibration. Uh, in, in terms of modern physics, the term is absolute zero. Uh, heat is vibration. The absence of all vibration is equal to absence of all heat, therefore absolute zero. This is the modern 
as the Swami said, atomic physics way of looking at this. And according to the majority of cosmologists these days, this is the fate of the universe, which is a very direct comparison with the Vedic idea of perfect equilibrium of the gunas, <clears throat> that the universe expands to such an extent that there can be no relationship to between any given particle or uh, there, the fields of vibration are so attenuated that they simply stop vibrating and you, you have uh, absolute zero, which is total darkness. Or, you know, it'll remind you very much of what is in many creation myths. This darkness was upon the deep idea <clears throat> that's in Genesis. So in normal, uh, in normal discussions, I often hear the word triple uh, phrase, triple divine qualities. Does that mean the three gunas or is it saying something else around? It? You know, I, I don't know that term, Bashkar, so I can't. Can you give me some context or do you want to pursue it? Uh, I'll pursue it. I think where I've heard it is in some Kriya Yoga meditation techniques, they talk about the triple divine quality, and I'm a little foxed with it as to what it means or does it really mean the three gunas. But I, so while I, you're on the topic of, go ahead. I don't, I don't know Kriya Yoga, the study of Kriya Yoga well enough to make any comment on that. And while we're on the topic of this right brain, left brain, a, a, and the Sankhya philosophy and Vedanta philosophy, is Sankhya tending to be more left brain and Vedanta being more right brain, or is that uh, the, the, the conclusion the, not good enough? The, the Vedas and virtually all of the Upanishads are right brain dominant utterances. That is to say, the Vedas are Shruti, that which was heard. Uh, so they heard this in the depths of meditation, which is by definition a right brain or heart centered activity. Um, there is no reasoning within meditation. It isn't. It doesn't defy reason, but it simply is not a reasoning activity. Contemplation is a reasoning activity. And con contemplation leads to concentration, which leads to meditation. So the Vedas and the Upanishads predominantly were right brain dominant. Sankhya philosophy, according to neuroanatomists and neuroanthropologists, the left brain as, a, as an aspect of our waking awareness is a relatively recent phenomenon. Now, they have different ideas about how old, and I don't remember them all. Uh, they go back, it goes back 200,000 years, uh, and it varies to somewhere sometime more recent. Uh, the, there was a book written of, that it was specifically directed to this called The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. When human beings by consciousness, the, the PhD, whose name I've forgotten, uh, he meant modern consciousness, the origin of modern consciousness in the breakdown of the bicameral mind. 
that human beings experienced themselves and the world in which they lived as a right brain phenomenon until a certain time ago in and as i say i remember the number 200,000 but uh, and the, but there are more recent formulations also Prior to this bicameral mind, we experienced the left mind as the voice of the gods, small g gods. This is the, in, in the book, The Origin of Consciousness and so on. This is, examples are given from myths and epics, the old myths and epics, the Greek uh, some of the Greek myths and epics, Gilgamesh uh, and other, uh, uh, other ancient writings. This can be seen in this idea that the Vedas are Shruti, something that was heard, something that was heard given to them by the gods. So that's, though I don't remember that being in the book on the origin of consciousness. Sankhya appears to be the first in the Indian lineage of, of uh, Philosophical, for, philosophical formulations to have been deliberately and reasonably left brain. It's, it's embedded in the very name, enumeration or counting. And Sri Krishna says that he himself formulated it. He says in the Gita, I was Kapila. So it is the great gift of these divine incarnations to try to give us a conceptualization of reality that, that grounds us in a way that we can move on from there so we are not so confused. Uh, Sankhya is definitely a very reasonable formulation. And if you want to read a very tidy summary of it, uh, Swami Prabhavananda wrote a very tidy summary of Sankhya cosmology uh, in as an appendix to his translation of Bhagavad Gita. And it's and the appendix is in the back of the book and it's simply called the Cosmology of the Gita. And he recommends in his translator's preface that you read that before you read the Gita so you will understand the cosmology from which Krishna is speaking because it is so very different from the cosmology of modern uh, reductionist science. Thank you. Thank you, Bhaskar. This is a good discussion, and I, I hope it's filling in some blanks for others. This is what we're up to. Anything else from anyone? Brother Shankara? Yes, Frank. Um, while while uh, the two of you were speaking about the gunas, um, I, I was just thinking, and I, I haven't formulated any conclusion, but I found it interesting about the Trinity. We have the three gunas in Christianity. You have um, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In uh, pagan, you have Maiden, Mother, Crone. You have physical, mental, emotional, body, mind, and spirit. I'm just was thinking like I'm, I'm wondering if there's some sort of 
correlation, connection, what's, I just thought, I, I was just thinking while you were speaking, that just kind of came up and I thought it was interesting and something worth thinking about. I was wondering what you thought about that. Uh, Frank, what I'll tell you is that I have thought about it and have come to no conclusion myself. Uh, I do not see any direct connection between the gunas and Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Uh, that seems to be a very different approach from the Abrahamic traditions uh, that uh, is an attempt to explain. Um, it's, it's a little bit like, a, a little bit like Brahman, Maya, Hiranyagarbha, uh, but uh, those those aren't equivalent with the gunas. So I, I, I agree with you, it is a conundrum. It is something worth contemplating and bringing into meditation. But uh, I, though, though three is definitely a, uh, it is the number of manifestation. One is the number of potential. Two is the number of uh, the, the, the possibility of potential becoming create. And three is the number of creation. So it's not surprising it shows up in all of these different ways. And it's, 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 it's square is nine which of course is a very significant number in many, many traditions around the world, especially within the uh, Hindu tradition. Uh, 108 or 1,008 are said to be very sacred numbers. Nine itself is said to be sacred. So, Frank, I don't have a ready answer or even an unready answer. <laughs> but it's a, you've posed a very good question. Yes, Samesh. Uh, on a very similar note, note that, you know, I had this that Tamas is something really bad. And then I read somewhere that uh, if you look at Adam, that also has neutrons, protons, and electrons. That's also three, and positive, negative, and neutral. Yes. And I was like, I don't question that. <laughs> you know, why is electron there? And then why to question that this guna is there? Is, uh, well, according, me... yes. according to um, John Dobson, the gunas express themselves. John Dobson it was a cosmologist. Uh, and Vedantist, a very profound thinker. And um, according to him, the, uh, the three gunas express themselves as mass, tamas, electricity, Rajas and gravity, sattva, mm. that which attracts and pulls together. Now, um, I'm trying to think now of the name of the paper that he published. It'll come to me. If it does, I'll interrupt and pop out with it, but uh, emphatically, uh, Tamas is not in, none of, none of that which is created by the divine presence <clears throat> can be anything other than perfect. This is the conclusion of many saints. <clears throat> So tamas cannot be imperfect. Rajas cannot be imperfect. Its application 
it through human activity can result in the unpleasant side, the dark side. <clears throat> and that is implicitly necessary. There can be no light without darkness and vice versa. So does that address what you were getting at, Somesh? Yes, thank you. Okay. okay. Anything else? Having come from Christian roots, I've also given that a lot of thought, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Here's my interpretation for what it's worth. The Father is God, the Son is the avatar, and the Holy Ghost is that spiritual energy which seems to come to your aid when you're reading the scriptures to help understand them or when you're thinking about the scriptures to help you get through life's challenges. Very nice. Very nice indeed. Uh, the Holy Ghost uh, was, that term was developed as part of the uh, emergence of Christianity as the state religion of Rome, uh, of Constantine. Before that, it was known as, in the, in, in, by the traditional Hebrew term, Shekinah, which is the divine feminine, or also translated as wisdom just exactly what you're saying that which comes to your aid when you are uh, studying the scriptures and so on hmm, i never thought of it that way yes yes that does make sense but the, before before the council of nicaea and whether it happened exactly at the council of nicaea i don't recall but the term holy ghost to replace uh, Shekinah was an, a development that came from uh, Constantine's Rome making Christianity the state religion. It's part of the patriarchy. Yes, I've noticed. Yes, it does seem that Holy Ghost seems to be masculine, where Shekinah seems to be a feminine energy. Well, Holy Ghost is 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 genderless. That's you know. It doesn't gesture toward either gender, father and son, both paternal, Holy Ghost. It doesn't really, within the Latin, contain any uh, gender uh, inflection. So one of the things that was true of Constantine's Rome and the emergence of Christianity as the state religion of Rome is a strong emphasis on patriarchy. Anything else? Okay. Do the gunas have any notion of feminine and masculine, do you think? They are inherently feminine in that they are the tools of the divine feminine all of them are inherently feminine. Thank you. So uh, if you, if you, uh, by, you know, remember now we've, we've had three terms for them, uh, tools, qualities, and what was the first? Wow. Sometimes just energies, energies, qualities, and I use the word tools. So, but the, 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 the if you read, particularly if you read the Devi Mahatmyam, the 700 verses, uh, in praise of the Divine Mother as in the form of Durga and her other forms. 
also known as the Chandi. You'll find some elaboration on the gunas as the tools of the Divine Mother, the Divine Feminine. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for the question. The yin and the yang are two. I was also just thinking about that. That's not a three. That's a two. More masculine, feminine. I was just thinking about that. Yeah, that, that's the duality. That's the duality rather than the trinity. The duality of darkness and light. If you look at the yin-yang symbol, it has darkness with a spot of light in it and light with a spot of darkness in it, in, in, implying that these things are inherent. There is no such thing as light without darkness and vice versa. So yeah, that's that's a representation of the duality. Thank you. So the Swami goes on now to elaborate a little bit about the, the gunas as they actually function. In the process of evolution, sattva is the essence of the form which has to be realized. In the process of evolution, sattva is the essence, the essence of the form which has to be realized. Tamas is inherent obstacle inherent is and in, is uh, Thomas is the inherent obstacle to its realization and Rajas is the power by which the obstacle is removed and the essential form made manifest. For the sake of illustration, let us us take a human rather than a cosmic example. A sculptor decides to make a figure of a horse. The idea of this horse, the form of it, which he sees in his imagination, is inspired by sattva. So notice the connection with imagination, with the right brain dominant aspect. The form of the horse that he wishes to sculpt occurs in his imagination, is inspired by sattva. Now he gets a lump of clay. This clay represents the power of tamas. Its formlessness is an obstacle which has to be overcome. Perhaps also there is an element of Thomas in the sculptor's own mind. He may think this is going to be a lot of trouble. It is difficult. I'm tired. Why should I make the effort? And I think we all know those questions. We all know that that as a form of obstacle when we are looking at taking up anything to be realized we are we these these things occur to us this is going to be a lot of trouble it is it is too difficult i'm tired why should i make the effort we all know those questions. We all know those feelings. Now notice that that is a left brain formulation. It is doubts, fears, concerns, and self-protection, all of which are left mind functions. And this isn't just some uh, reasoning process you can read the neuroanatomist jill bolte taylor's new book whole brain living and you will see that she very carefully 
enumerates that these kinds of questions arise from the, the activities of the left cerebral cortex. Many of these questions prompted by the left <coughs> limbic system. <coughs> so the, the tamas tends to be a left brain function. But here the force of tamas comes to his aid. No, is that no? For the force of rajas. But here the force of rajas comes to his aid. Rajas, in this instance, represents the sculptor's will to conquer his own lethargy and the difficulties of his medium. It represents also the muscular exertion which he puts forth in order to complete his work. If a sufficient amount of rajas is generated, the obstacle of tamas will be overcome and the ideal form of sattva will be embodied in a tangible clay object. From this example, it should be obvious that all three gunas are necessary for an act of creation or the creation itself, because what the Swami was talking about was evolution from the potential to the tangible, the manifest. Sattva alone would be just an unrealized idea. Rajas without sattva would be mere undirected energy. Rajas without tamas would be like a lever without a fulcrum. If we wish to describe the gunas individually, we can say that sattva represents all that is pure, ideal, and tranquil while rajas expresses itself in action, motion, and violence. And tamas is the principle of solidity, immobile resistance, and inertia. As has been said above, all three gunas are present in everything, but one guna always predominates. Sattva, for example, predominates in sunlight. Now that, let's not race past that. Sunlight, if we think about sunlight, and what sunlight is and does, sunlight is immensely powerful. It is sine qua non. Without sunlight, no life on earth. Hmm. But sunlight does not directly do anything. It doesn't grow the seed. The seed grows because of the presence of sunlight. Rajas is the erupting volcano so, sattva, sunlight, rajas, the erupting volcano, and tamas in a block of granite. In the mind of man, the gunas are usually found in a relationship of extreme instability. Hence, the many moods through which we pass in the course of a single day. Sattva causes our comments of our moment. Sattva causes our moments of inspiration, disinterested affection, quiet joy, and 
meditative calm. Rajas brings on our outbursts of rage and fierce desire. It makes us restless and discontented, but it is also responsible for our better phases of constructive activity, energy, enthusiasm, and physical courage. Thomas is the mental bog into which we sink when we, when, whenever sattva and rajas cease to prevail. In the state of Thomas, we exhibit our worst qualities, sloth, stupidity, obstinacy, and hopeless despair. So before we go on to the Swami's explanation of what the Bhagavad Gita has to say about it, is there anything more from anyone, <clears throat> from your own experience, from your own wisdom, or any concern or question that <clears throat> this explanation of the gunas raises? Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. Does Thomas have any positive attributes well, it, it is absolutely necessary for the other two to work. As, as uh, was pointed out, without the, the quality of inertia, that is the fulcrum through which a lever works, there would be no lever. You'd, you'd press on the lever and it would simply move away from you. Uh, a great passenger train at rest is in a tamasic state. But it, it, nobody could board the train if it weren't in that state. If everybody had to run to jump on the train, most people wouldn't be able to ride a train. So things have to be at rest. Then that at rest state is overcome. And, you know, to use to further the example of the train, you know, the train cannot be boarded without its tamasic state. It will not make its journey without its rajasic state. And ultimately it reaches its destination, which is the sattvic state. Thank you. The reason why I was asking is because um, I've always, well, not I've always, I've noticed that Thomas is usually depicted um, almost completely negative. Yep. And sattva is depicted as almost completely positive. And I, I was just wondering if they both have the divine in them and the both in them you know, like we was talking about the yin yang, the light, the dark. I was just wondering if I was just getting just part information, if there wasn't more that maybe I was missing. That's why I wanted to clarify. Well, you, you very, very aptly asked, Frank. The light and the dark exist in both. One way of talking about the three gunas is as the three robbers. All of them because they distract us from the reality are an obstacle to our realization of the reality, our full realization, even sattva. Its downside is this sense of contentment. Oh, I, I'm, I've reached this blissful state through the practice of japa or whatever form of meditation, I've reached this blissful state and there's no need to go on any further. I'm, I'm content. Well, as Swami Vivekananda pointed out strongly when he was asked about that very situation, 
He said, no, this is just a way station. Don't be robbed of your will to continue. Stop not till the goal is reached. The goal is what? The stilling of all the gunas, the bringing of the gunas to perfect equilibrium within yourself so that there are no longer any vibrations in the mind stuff. The mind stuff is not contained in your head. <coughs> it isn't contained in your head and your heart. It is contained in every cell of your body. The, the three gunas are generators of vibration, ever more subtle as you go along, there are higher forms of tamas, higher forms of rajas, and higher and higher forms of sattva. But they are still going to cause vibrations in the mind stuff. Even in, in the depths of meditation, where there is nothing but the awareness that you're meditating, all else is silence. That awareness itself is a vibration in the mind stuff. Your body may be perfectly still. You may no longer even be aware of your body. But you're aware that you are. There is still the experiencer, the experiencing, and the experienced. It's only when this fully ceases that your universe disappears and the full reality of which your universe and all universe is a manifestation appears. But we can't talk about that because there's no one there, no experiencer to talk about what is realized. Mm. I wonder, you know, when you were saying that, it reminded me of a quote when the Buddha said, when you reach the top of the mountain, keep climbing. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> yes. Okay. I hadn't heard that one before, Frank. That's, that's so like the Buddha. <laughs> you know, he... He, he invented the koan. It wasn't Zen Buddhism that in, invented it. When you reach the top of the mountain, keep climbing. Is that in the Diamond Sutras or where did you, where did you read that? Do you know? I sincerely don't know. Okay. I, I, something I've heard a long time ago and it resonated with me. All right. Um, maybe, one, maybe one of our people who's adept at uh, uh, using the computer and finding quotes will be able to tell us before the end of the hour. Which is just about over. It's 12.59. That might be a, a good place to stop. As a matter of fact, it is, yes. Uh, because now uh, the Swami is going to go on and tell us about several, what's said in several chapters of Bhagavad Gita that uh, uh, that uh, exemplify Krishna's use of Sankhya philosophy and the gunas to explain what he's trying to teach us. So we'll go on from there next week. Anything yes, else? Uh, yes, Sumesh. Yeah, just what Frank asked, and that is, you know, one of the things that came to my mind is that uh, like a sattva can be for me, like, okay, if I jump from this mountain, I'll be flying. Like, that's like imagination, right? And rajas can be, okay, yeah, go ahead, do it. You know, I, and that's where tamas can be that, okay, no, you may die. And <laughs> yes. It is useful, so, uh, where it does stop us from, you know, some, some of the consequences. Oh, yes, oh, yes. There, the, if, if, if you read, these chapters of the Gita, or you read the Chandi, you'll find that all three of the gunas are absolutely necessary 
to manifest what we experience. We mm -hmm. are a product of those three gunas. Mm -hmm. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, that's why I recommended uh, this book, this new book by Jill Bolte Taylor, Whole Brain Living. She says that all four aspects of our waking awareness, and that then has depths into the uh, subconscious and so on, but all four aspects of our waking awareness are absolutely necessary to our uh, ability to function. And she enumerates these as the left brain limbic function which is the alert, uh, the reptile brain that's constantly uh, monitoring the environment to see if there are any dangers. Because if you're a small reptile, uh, you're constantly in danger. Uh, and then in bringing those uh, possibilities of danger to the to the attention to the uh, attention to the awareness of the left cerebral con cortex, which then assesses them, decides whether there's really a danger or not, and if there is a danger, uh, what to do about it. The other side of our limbic system and right brain cortex, um, right cerebral con cortex, has a very different function, and it very much parallels the uh, sattva, uh, the appreciation of unity and, well, anyway, without going off on a long dissertation about that. And the cooperation of the two is where we have this rajas. It is the, it is the creator, the, the inspiration comes in the right cerebral cortex the obstacles to its realization come in the left cerebral cortex and the cooperation of the two uh, uh, allow the inspiration to be realized through the rajasic function and she, her book whole brain living is about how to maximize that cooperation Thank you, Samesh. Anything else from anyone? All right, dears. Brother Shankara? Yes. I so guess I should read that um, book that you just mentioned because my question was going to be that how do you overcome the inertia or the lack of energy that comes from a physical condition or the medications that are used to treat the physical condition. Sometimes it makes you drowsy or, you know, um, mind is clouded and there's just no enthusiasm to get up and do something. But I guess if Jill Bolte Taylor could overcome that degree of almost loss of her all functions and then um, come all back left, to- All left brain functions, yes. Yeah. Uh, so maybe that book would give some answers, but I was just wondering. Well, it is, it is a beautiful book, and and I can't recommend it highly enough. She is a, uh, what, uh, you know, as uh, I forget now who used the term, a lovely little thinker. Oh, it's of Monty Python. <laughs> a lovely, she's a lovely little thinker. Um. And actually, it's interesting if you ask Jill Bolte Taylor who she is now. I've seen her interviewed and she, they ask, well, who are you, Jill Bolte Taylor? And she says, I am a being as big as the universe. And being, she, she means as a, as a verb. I am a being as big as the universe. And she means it. And it's from her own experience. 
And so she's able to bring the energy of that being as big as the universe to what she does, which is partly an answer to your question, Swam. We access through meditation, which she came, that, that which she came to by having everything that was an obstacle to its realization removed by her stroke. So she accessed the full right brain personality, as she calls it, the right brain being, because there was nothing else left to her. And then that gave her, anyway, I will go on and on about Joe Bolte Taylor. She's, she has two books that are both worth your attention. The, the book that about her having the stroke that the, she then took eight years to overcome the effects of, and that's called My Stroke of Insight. And then her new, new book, very recently published, Whole Brain Living. She's a, a great modern, uh, she's a trained neuroanatomist and uh, spiritual philosopher. Anything else? Thank you, Swayam. Okay. Om Hari Om Om Asato Ma Satgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotirgamaya Mutyor ma amrutangamaya, abir abir moiti. O dearly beloved Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from this realm of endless noise and relentless confusion to thine abode of silence, serenity, clarity, and peace. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. Lead us from death to immortality. Light us through and through, light us through and through with thy everlasting shining presence. Om Hari Om Tat Sat. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. <clears throat> May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. May we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. So tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, for those of you who decide to join us, the topic is the wonder of your stardust spacesuit. Any last thoughts from anyone? All right. Until tomorrow morning or whenever we see you next, Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai.